Welcome to the Freedom Bros Podcast. I am not Dustin, and I am not Greg either. Uh, my name is Brian Allman, and I am here tonight solo because uh, both of them have uh, had things come up. So I we will be talking with Carrie Hanks very shortly, uh, and then we'll be you know catching up on a few other things. Um, I don't know if any of you just finished watching the State of the Union address. It was I, I entertaining, might be a word for it, but. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's something to talk about. Things that are happening in the state house here in Boise. Uh, did you know that they just killed a bill today that would have prevented taxpayer dollars from going to teachers unions? I'll bet you didn't even know that taxpayer dollars were going to teachers unions, but they, they were unable to uh, pass that bill. Uh, it shows you one of the real impasses in our state legislature, people who are beholden to special interests, such as those public sector unions. But uh, if, if you want to go to Gem State Chronicle after Freedom Bros, I just wrote an article about that. A very short one, because it's a, been a crazy day, busy day. Um, I'm sure everybody caught Capital Clarity earlier today. Ron Nate gave an explanation of how the Freedom Index works. That's a, a tool that you can use to hold your lawmakers accountable. And, um, you know, that's really what voting is all about, isn't it? You're, you go to the polls and you make a choice between candidate A or B or C or whomever, uh, and, you know, you need a reason to vote. Do you vote because somebody has really nice hair or lack thereof? Do you vote because they had the most, uh, the best mailer with the best graphics? Or do you vote because of what they stand for? And when it comes to incumbent lawmakers, uh, what they stand for is pretty obvious because they're voting on it. They're voting on hundreds of bills. And, you know, the proof in the pudding is in the eating. So the proof in the legislature is in the voting. So it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what kind of game they talk, how conservative they sound when they're on the campaign trail. What matters is how they vote. And that's what the Freedom Index is about. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, because uh, our guest tonight has an opponent in the legislature, an incumbent who has made some very interesting votes, shall we say. But uh, enough from me. Let's uh, roll the intro and get started. I really could get used to having a producer. Anyway, let's uh, bring on Carrie Hanks and uh, see what she's up to. Hello, Carrie. Brian. Hello. That's yeah, great to be here tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Well, it's uh, it's great to see you again. Um, I've run into a few times over the past couple of years. It's always a pleasure. So you're out. Uh, where exactly do you live? Tell us about that. So I live near St. Anthony, which is north of Rexburg and Idaho Falls. Um, I live right by the sand dunes. Uh, a lot of people know where those are. And yeah, I live in Fremont County and love it out here on the farm. I have not been out to eastern Idaho as much as I should. I've you know, obviously spent some time here in the Treasure Valley, a little bit up north, but I need to get out there to the east side and see, uh, you know, see what it's like. It's, uh, it sounds really interesting. Well, we can show you Mesa Falls. It's the gateway to Yellowstone Park. We have Island Park, which is a great recreational area. So, yeah, it's a really great area out here. So, obviously, you've been in the legislature before. And now you're running again. Um, but before we get to that, tell us about you. Uh, you know, where did you come from? How did you become the person you are today? And what led you to uh, appearing on this show tonight? Okay. Well, I was raised in Idaho Falls. Um, I met my uh, now husband at Rick's College. It was then. Hmm. Uh, we went to Utah for a couple of years, came back um, to the farm. We, by then, we had three boys. And my husband said, I don't know how to raise boys anywhere but on the farm. So, and we ended up with six boys <laughs> and one daughter. So it's been a, it's been a really great place to raise our children. Um, I wasn't, I wouldn't even date farm when I was in high school because I didn't want to, I guess maybe I knew I was going to end up on a farm. I, <laughs> it was inevitable. <laughs> it must have been. But I actually love it, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Um, it's a great place to raise our children. Now our grandkids, and they're they're on tractors and um, just learning the farm. Some of the farm things. Um, not all not all of our grandkids are into farming, but we have eighteen grandchildren right now. 
So, yeah. So that's, um, I, I thought about this. Um, well, I guess I should finish. So I actually drive school bus part time. Uh, I started in the 80s, quit for a while and back at it. And in the meantime, I also learned how to drive semi trucks. So when needed, I can do that as well. And I kind of like it. It's kind of a kick to do that. Um, let's see. Um, in high school, I didn't get into, I never did debate or speech. I never, mm -hmm. ever had this on my list um, to be involved in politics. I did write letters to the editor and I, I was involved a little bit in the Republican Party at the central committee level, but never <laughs> thought I would end up here. Uh, when we had our uh, redistricting in 2012, the man, um, Paul Romrell, had been a commissioner. He was running for state legislature and I just impulsively said, I'm running against him. <laughs> And that was in 2012, didn't, didn't win then, but my name got out there. So that's what I always tell um, people that are thinking about running. You know, you may not run your first or even your second time, but um, to get your name out there and to express what you believe, um, it, was, it was something for me because in 2016, um, former representative Joanne Wood, who served 32 years, uh, she asked me to run, and I said, nope, been there, done that. But I really, I listened to Rafael Cruz. He came and spoke at, at the Idaho Falls Lincoln Day. And the only thing I remember that night was he said, Christians don't get involved in politics because it's such a dirty business. But if only evil people are involved, then only evil people are elected. And for some reason that just hit me and I actually kind of started crying and, and I felt like I was receiving a call mm -hmm. <laughs> to run. For me, politics is really that the, um, it's the war that, that Satan wages on God, our heavenly father and Jesus Christ. And it's, it's a war of control versus uh, choice. And so for me, that's what I remember, and that's what I think of as I um, campaign, as I decide if I, if I was going to run, um, as I was done, I, I wasn't going to run again. And I just felt compelled when I watched how uh, Rod Furness has been voting. And, and it's just been really amazing, the doors that have been opened, the things that I told God that I needed in order to run. Uh, he, he sent me an amazing campaign manager and friends that that have stepped up and they're they're really helping. So I just I don't know. I feel really pumped about it. And I feel really optimistic. And so yeah, that's the basics. <laughs> so. You know that 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 is uh, you know interesting. You know you you go out there and you run once and you know you lose, but then you stay involved and you come back and you know you get a rematch and you know defeat the person who beat you that's uh, always you know fun i'm sure uh shocking actually i was shocked when i won yeah? the first time. well tell us about that so, so so you ran the first time and, and lost and came back ran again and you won and had to deal with the repercussions of that. What was it like, you know, coming to Boise for the first time as a state legislator and, you know, being on a committee and being on the floor? What, you know, what's that like for a freshman coming in for the first time? Well, honestly, I was terrified. Uh, but there were people that got some of us freshmen together, like Dorothy and Priscilla, um, Christy and I, and just kind of talked with us about what to expect a little bit. Uh, we went there and Heather and Ron, Nate, took us under their wings and and just kind of showed us the ropes. And um, it is overwhelming for sure. But I, I believe when you're on God's errand, he helps you. He gives you the strength, the courage, the confidence that is required to do this. And so I, I have just felt his hand in my life throughout all of this. Um, I did beat a two-term incumbent, the one that 
that won in the first place and in 2016. And yeah, I was on my way and, and um, you know, we learn a lot as we go and, and it has been kind of a rough road because I lost the last election, mm -hmm. then I won an election, then I lost an election and it's like, <laughs> Well, I guess you're due to win again then. Uh, at the, at That's what I think. <laughs> so, you know, not, not to keep harping too much on, on your previous tenure, because we want to talk about the future, but I, I'm curious what you think has changed in the legislature. You were there for a couple of terms. Um, do you think it's mostly the same, kind of the same battles being fought, the same issues, or is, has something changed? To some degree, it's the same battles. Um, for example, the grocery tax repeal, and they didn't even... Uh, Put that up this year but we've been trying to get that done since 2017 when it actually did pass um i i've heard that it's it's a little tougher that there's just more rancor uh the main street caucus of course didn't exist uh when i was in there and that has has been a force to trying to change things and actually if people would look at what the main street caucus for them for the most part it just they are the liberal republicans they are what we sometimes call rhinos but they are the middle of the road the establishment uh good old boys whatever you want to call them that's what they are and um as i visit with people as i'm campaigning they don't want the good old boys club they want uh traditional republican values and so that's that's what I represent. That's uh, what I advocate for. Well, I've pulled up your uh, you know your legislator profile on the Idaho Freedom Index from your previous term compared to your opponents, and and there is a stark difference. Uh, in your last year, twenty twenty two, you had a ninety eight and a half percent rating on the Freedom Index, yes. ninety eight point three percent on spending. Meanwhile. Uh, Representative Furness is sitting down at 37% on freedom and 9.5% on spending. That's usually, high. you know, well, you, you, usually uh, the, you know, single digit spending score, that indicates that they're basically just voting for every budget. Um, in fact, I remember watching the debate on the maintenance budgets, um, you know, how they've changed the system of doing budgeting. They've just done the, the basic budgets from last year as a yes. packet, and then they're doing the increases later. And it was a, obviously a big fight. And there, there was a lot of backroom shenanigans and, you know, uh, coups going on over that. But I remember watching the debate on the maintenance budget and Representative Furness, who does, uh, he does sit on JFAC, uh, got up and said that uh, it's, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember exactly, you know, word for word. Um, what I took away from what he said was that it's not the job of the legislature to worry about these bills, these budgets. We do that in JFAC and I've got all these financial degrees. Uh, so you don't need to worry about it. Just trust us. Uh, that, that, that was what I was uh, taking as the implication from what he said. You know, what, what do you think about that perspective when it comes to spending taxpayer dollars? Well, I think that he thinks a lot of himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's part of the problem is, is there are people in there that think they know best for us. And those budgets, uh, although they review them, they, they think they do a good job on that. You know, we still scrutinize that. <clears throat> and it kind of depends on the makeup of the, the JFAC as well. If they are more on the liberal side, um, when I was in there before, Priscilla and Ron were on JFAC, and sometimes they were the only votes no on some of that. And so, and they were more of fiscal hawks. They um, took very seriously that we needed to protect that money and and not overspend taxpayer money because this is coming from families. This is coming from people that don't have a lot of money sometimes. And, and we need to be so responsible for that. And so if he's just, you know, saying, well, I know best for you. Um, I know I don't like that. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's a little bit what I've noticed is, is that he's very, very sure of himself. That is a really good way to describe um, what he does. Well, if, if Representative Furness is sure of himself, um, I'll, I'll say what Dustin always says, and that is that, you know, this show is open to all uh, who are running for office, and he is 
fully welcome to come on the show and explain his perspective and why he, you know, does the things he does and why he thinks that, uh, you know, taxpayer supported, you know, feminine hygiene products are an important thing. But <laughs> I, I'd love to hear that one. Yeah, I, I, let's let's have a discussion. It's uh, you know, it's unscripted. There, where this is live, so there's no cutting. You know, it's it's whatever you say, whatever I say. It, it's all just out there. Yes. So, <coughs> excuse me. I, I do I do think there's a big. Uh, um, the, the, there's two types of people who go into the legislature. Those who, when it, when it comes to spending money, at least, mm -hmm. those who think, you know, I'm going to go be a steward of the tax dollars and make sure that, you know, mm -hmm. we spend as little as possible. And if uh, if we do spend something, it's for a very good reason. And then there's others who, I, it's like a kid in a candy store. It's look at all this money we get to play with. We can appropriate this here and this here. We can give you know, public schools, a $2 billion. We can, you know, give all this more. We're, we're going to spend two and a half million dollars to celebrate the 250th anniversary of America. Uh, it's, it's just, it, it, it's like there's no limiting principle to how much they're going to spend. Well, yes. And for example, uh, two years ago, we had a $2 billion surplus. And so many of us wanted to return it to the, the taxpayer. Well, 500 million of it was returned in $300 checks. A few, some people I've talked to never did get one of those checks for whatever reason. I know it was based on, you know, tax returns such as that, but we returned $300 per person out of a $2 billion surplus. Uh, I, one of the representatives proposed a, ta a property tax holiday for that December. What would that have done for our for our families, for our um, people that are on limited incomes, if they had received a property tax holiday? Nope, didn't have to pay any property tax. That that would have been such a great Christmas gift. Couldn't do it. So so we did about I believe it was five hundred million. We we rebated some of that to the people, but then the rest of it just kind of trickled into. Um, departments, agencies, you know, the requests that were made. And, and that I think is a big difference between um, uh, Rod and, and myself. Um, I, I totally feel that, that, that when we have a surplus, it should go back to the people. We shouldn't find places to spend it. It needs to go back to the people that paid it in in the first place. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, it's funny, the uh special session where the governor called the legislature back, you know, you, you were there one last time to decide what to do with this money. Look, we've got a windfall. What should we do with it? Uh, that was actually the first time I'd ever gone down to the Capitol, you know, when it's in session. And I actually testified in the committee about how, you know, you're just going to give this away to, you know, the public school system that you just gave historic and unprecedented, uh, you know, in, um, uh, investments too. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the whole thing, uh, what I came away from that seeing was that the whole affair was choreographed. The, <laughs> the governor and his people and his friendly legislators had already decided exactly what they were going to do. It was, you know, debating and passing the, the one bill was, it, it was a fait accompli. It was already done. So what was, what was the point? Well, and what happens if we vote against that because we don't think it's a good idea that we think we could do better? Then they send out the mailers that say she voted against tax relief. She wouldn't give you uh, school funding. She wouldn't. That's what they do is if you vote against something because you believe that we can do better, that more, for example, more money needs to be returned to the taxpayer, then they use that against you. And and that's what's difficult. But um we're trying other ways to get the word out this time. So we'll see what happens with that. So looking back one last time, what uh, in your time, what was maybe your proudest moment, uh, um, a debate that you uh, gave or a bill that you sponsored or, you know, something that you got across the finish line? What, uh, you know, what, what, what do you look back the most part proudly on? Well, I don't think about it a lot, but, um, I figure it was a little teeny miracle at the end of the, um, I don't, I think it was 2021, I believe when, uh, we, we had been locked down, even though, um, the governor said he didn't lock the state down, there was vaccine mandates and, and mask mandates going around bills for that. 
And we went back into session supposedly to remedy that, to take care of that. Well, we did not do that. I think that was when uh, they went ahead and, and censured. Uh, oh, yes. So, yeah. That made so, me angry. So it just happened that I wanted to say something and I had a few things written down and I received a letter from um, an email from a family that had told me about their their dad, their grandpa, that he was working at the INL. They, he was told he had to have a shot. He'd already had COVID, but they told him he had to have that shot. Well, he didn't want to do it, but he finally went and had the shot. And within just a few weeks, he died. Hmm. And I, I just... I was so angry and frustrated and so sad that we had gone back into session. What we thought was going to take care of that and, and stop the mask and the vax mandates didn't do it. So um, our, oh gosh, chaplain, he stood up and he was, he had quoted a, a, one of the coaches and I can't remember even now, but um, the video is actually on my website. And it says uh, that I scolded the representatives or something like that. I scolded the house, I think it was. But um, so I stood up and just, you know, asked for time to speak. And I started talking about the that quote that he had made. And it just said something about do what we can do, what I can do or something to that effect. And so then I started rolling out and, and I... We're not supposed to read on the house floor, so I was trying not to read, but I, I read that letter from that family, and I said, we came here to to help the, the citizens, and I looked up the camera and everything, I think, we came here to help the citizens, and we have not done that, and um, I was so thankful, because I believe God allowed me to have that time because sometimes they'll shut you down and say, we have to have unanimous consent in order to continue, but it did not happen. And so I was able to do that. And then one of the other representatives, we, we kind of talked a little bit about wanting to say something. And one of the other ones got up and of course, Bedkey shut um, that representative down. But I, I feel that, and it wasn't just me, but I was grateful to be the messenger to at least say, look to our to our people some of us came here seriously prepared to address the vax mandates the mask mandates and we didn't do that so i think that was one of the I, i'm really thankful i was able to do that and then about a year later i was at our the, the fair the uh, eastern idaho fair down in blackfoot and this family oh gosh sorry this family walked up to me and they said, you're Carrie Hanks, aren't you? And I said, yes. And they said, you talked about my dad on the house floor. Mm. We really appreciated it. And so that really meant a lot to me because it was sort of a tribute to their, to their dad, to their grandpa that he, he didn't totally die anonymously. And so I, I think that had a big influence on their family. And so I was, I really appreciated that I was able to do that for them. It's incredibly frustrating that so many of the people who shut down our yeah. state, uh, shut down churches and businesses, uh, stood by and watched as people were forced to, you know, get an experimental vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all, and, and so many of those people are just that there's been no consequences and, yeah. you know, it just, it doesn't look like there's going to be, how, how, how do you, how do you as a citizen and as a legislator, a potential legislator now, move forward with making sure that something like that doesn't happen again, you know, maybe trying to hold people accountable, but also being able to keep, you know, moving forward and not, you know, just get stuck looking in the past? Well, that's one reason I'm running. Uh, we need more patriots. We need more people who are saying, look, the focus should be on families, on individual rights, not on big business not on big pharmacy and hospitals and whatever IACI, which is the Idaho Association of Commerce and Industry for any listeners, um, not for what their agenda is, but the agenda that fits with the Republican platform and with the constitution. And that's what my votes have shown. You know, they, they threw people in jail. 
um, for singing. They um, find uh, restaurant owners because they said, look, we got to keep the restaurant open or we're going to lose it. Um, that's just shameful, especially in Idaho that's supposed to be so red. So we have a, a lot of conservatives, a lot of people that believe that way, but you know, they're busy with their own lives. We found that down here in, in Southeast Idaho. We try to get people to run for precincts for, um, to help with campaigns. And, and some people are good to help with campaigns, but they're just so busy. Um, you know, we send out action alerts, things like that. And, and people just don't feel they have the time to do that. And, and so that's one of the things that is one of the reasons I'm running that, um, I feel like I have a bigger platform as a representative to try and get information out. That's, that's what I believe I'm here to do is to try to persuade people to get involved. And, and to protect what we do have here in Idaho. So I don't know if uh, your opponent has, you know, said anything about you personally, um, but if he did, I'm sure he would uh, say you're some sort of extremist. Now, you know, for, for those listening, um, Carrie pub sent, sent me an editorial and I published it over at the Gem State Chronicle. Uh, you can go find it there uh, about, you know, this label extremist. Um, Tell, tell us a little bit about that. How, do you see yourself as an extremist? Uh, what, you know, why do you think they use that label? And do you think it has any bearing on your voters? Well, yeah, I think it does have some bearing. You know, in this day and age, um, I've even talked to some people and I've said, hey, be prepared because I, will, I am called an extremist. And they just kind of laugh and they say, well, I probably am too. Because it, it used to be the mainstream used to be those of us who believed in individual rights who believed in the government leaving us alone, um, lower taxes, less regulations. That all used to be mainstream, and now it has become extreme. And so that's what's hard is the paradigm has shifted. So uh, those of us who do believe in those, those basic individual rights, um, our Republican platform, you know, they're, there's been a lot stirred up with that as well. Mm -hmm. But the platform is really based on constitutional principles and things that I believe we, as tr we traditional Republicans believe in. But we keep being, um, I guess the word now is gaslighted. We keep being told that, that those of us who believe in those things are extreme. We're hardliners. We won't bend. And, you know, there's some things that I will not bend on, like my principles. I will not bend. There are compromises sometimes that can be made, but not on basic values and principles. So um, I'm not willing to horse trade a vote. I have been asked to do that, to get my mask mandate bill uh, to uh, unmask. Idaho is what I called it. It's, it's mm -hmm. close to what Jason and and is it, is it Brian Lenny? I think Brian Lenny, yeah. they have that bill this year, not moving, just like it's happened. Stuck. Yep. Just when I, just like when I had it, it passed with, if not veto proof, almost veto proof. I think it was 46, it was either 47 votes, which um, my now opponent voted against that, his, his substitute that day. And uh, so that kind of shows <laughs> Where he was on that because she wouldn't have gone uh, away without his his okay but how insane is it that you know and there are any legislators in the capitol who will vote to say that government agencies have the right to t force you to wear a mask when you go outside or go to business or you know yeah. go to the county clerk's office well and what's interesting is very few of us would wear masks actually rod did wear a mask um there are photos of him wearing a mask on the house floor, but um, we did not have to wear uh, masks. And I'm sure part of it probably was because Bedke wasn't, wasn't willing to wear a mask. We, oh, good for him. <laughs> yeah, we all knew that that wasn't real. Um, it, it just didn't make sense. And, and it's like I said when I testified, I said, you know, if these masks worked, if people were dying in the streets, you can bet people would be in their homes. They yeah. would be in masks if they went out. But um, people, 
we have a lot of common sense in Idaho. <laughs> and so people just didn't believe all that stuff. And I think we don't have all that rhetoric, you know, in the big cities and stuff like that. There's just a lot of pressure. I know over in Washington, my relatives lives, she said they were li literally pretty much locked down for two years. And she would mm. even walk out on the streets and stuff and she would wear a mask um, because you would be in big trouble if you didn't. And see, that's Washington, but that's not Idaho. And so we shouldn't have had those um, basically forced in, in some of the businesses to um, be vaccinated, be vaxxed, uh, jabbed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was a real vaccine. So, well, I, uh, my family and I, we moved from Washington in 2018, so okay. almost six years ago. Oh, yeah. And for a while, I second guessed my choice. You know, I, I had a good, stable job there. I, I love the weather and the, the geography back there, and all my family's back there. But then when COVID happened, even as bad as it was here, it was a lot worse in Washington, and I was oh. so glad that I was in Idaho for it than rather than Washington. That's I, I don't know if you saw the bad and yeah, a lot of a lot of places were <laughs> worse than Idaho, but there were a lot of us that pushed back on that. Like yeah. I, I did wear a mask um, when I gave blood at first, but then I thought, I know this is just bogus. I just I can't. I just felt I could not wear a mask. So. And even the people who advocate masks, I think they feel it's bogus too. I don't know if you saw the State of the Union address tonight. Senator oh, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yeah, Bernie Sanders was, you know, when it cut to shots of the crowd, he was wearing a mask. Oh, but then when he's up shaking hands at the end and <laughs> talking to people, he, he had it off. What's the point? <laughs> That's great. It's, it, do, it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it's, it's like it's become uh, an accessory now to show which side you're on. I, I believe that, yeah, yeah, to a degree. And it shows the submission that people have. And and I think it's sad because, you know, some of these people that are ill or that or have uh, weakened immune systems, I think that they think that's going to help them. You know, they kind of lean on that. Mm -hmm. think, well, if I have this on, then I'm probably going to be okay. So I think it's a fake, I, I think it's a false sense of security, even with, with the mask. Yeah, it's 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 like in a you know fantasy story you get you know some you know magic talisman from you know the 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 wizard uh, that'll ward off disease or something. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I I think Greg would be uh, disappointed if I didn't talk about uh, guns. So, oh, um, what you know, what do you think about guns? <laughs> oh, I love them. <laughs> What do you think about uh, what do you think about gun control and common sense background checks and red flag laws? I don't see how that jibes with shall not be infringed. And I I have co-sponsored, I have sponsored bills that we've tried to get through. Um, stand your ground, a, a better stand your ground and better castle doctrine bills. Um, the first year I was in there, oh my gosh, Christy Zitto and I were trying to get a couple bills through. And I think mine was something on a residency because I, I gosh, I can't even remember now. I'm sorry. But but we I remember going in to talk to Tom Lurcher, who was the state affairs chairman. And he would say, Well, you need to do this, you need to check with that person. It, it was just this big rigmarole the whole time we were in there. It's been um, nicer to have um, Brent Crane in there. I don't agree with him on everything, obviously, but um, he has a, he's allowed. That's what chairmen do. They mm -hmm. allow these bills <laughs> to go through more, but it's still like this year. Look what's happened with the um, the teacher and staff being able to carry. I think four fifteen stuck won't go through state affairs. That's that's just what happens. That's what happened with my mask bill. We can't get those bills through. So we've got to clean house. We've got to get these Main Street caucus, these liberal Republicans out of there and, and get back to, I mean, I hate to even say common sense gun laws, but um, un, not being infringed. It's like, um, so Rod, 
is called red flag rod sometimes because he like if 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 he was asked about a bill a, a second amendment bill he would say well i have to see the bill um i i remember uh greg passed around these these cards about do you support red flag laws and he wouldn't he wouldn't answer that um and he has said some things about uh I know Second Amendment uh, people that that I'll let Greg share that at some point, but uh, yeah, he and I don't think um, I would bet money that Rod has never co-sponsored a Second Amendment bill. So uh, there's a really big difference there, mm -hmm. and yes, um, in fact, um, that's that's one of my uh, big platform beliefs is that we need to protect that second amendment because if we don't have the second amendment, we don't have any of the other um, protections because we have to be able to defend ourselves. We have to be able to defend ourselves against criminals, against uh, a tyrannical government, which it sure seems like we're getting closer to that. <laughs> so well, let, let, let me know when that whole thing starts and, uh, We'll be ready, but uh, un until then, we 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 do our battles in the ballot box. Um, right. You know, you talked about you know all these good bills. Uh, Greg Pruitt, who um, maybe he'll pop in here. Uh, he uh, he just gave an update yeah. about the Idaho Second Amendment Alliance, um, and there's a bunch of bills they're pushing that they're supporting that are just stuck. And it seems like a lot of them are getting stuck on the Senate side. Oh yeah. So wh why are you running for House and not Senate? It, it, it seems like we need a, a lot of good people over there too to break that logjam. I know. Uh, Van Burtonshaw is pretty much impossible to beat um, for for various reasons. But but when I look at, I, I mean, I wasn't planning on running again. But I'll tell you what what actually um, spurred me to run is when I saw him on the House floor talking about that feminine hygiene product. Oh, oh I, excuse me for saying this, but he talked about peeing pooping and period on the house floor it was just i was shocked i kept thinking that he was going to get um gaveled down and he just kept going at it and it was insulting to women the things that he said also as i do drive school bus i have been in several girls bathrooms throughout the area i've never seen a bathroom that did not have girls products available there so his bill was to provide those um, products from the state level. Well, he comes home and campaigns that he believes in local control and that local uh, focus. That's what, what that's what we should have is local government, local control, all this blah blah blah. And yet this bill that there wasn't brings that up and talks. It was just disgusting. <laughs> it was, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, um, and there's several things in there, the proper role of government. He said, he said the proper role of government is to supply toilet paper, soap, paper towels, and feminine hygiene products. I, I just, <laughs> I watched that and I just was flabbergasted just as I basically am now, it's, it was just shocking to me. And of all I, the things, you, know, you only have so much political capital each year. Right. So of all the things to try and spend it on. Yeah. And that should have been, I mean, some 60 plus year old guy talking about feminine hygiene products. I mean, really, that was just terrible. And what's funny is um, our local uh, Neil Larson show, uh, he does a radio show every morning from six to 10. And he did an edited version of that speech. And he took like uh, Raymond and gosh, I don't know if it was Roten, but it was a couple of the, the men that were sitting around um, uh, Furnace when he was giving the speech and it showed their faces. He, he zoomed in on them and they were like smirking and like, you know, they, oh, it was, it was hilarious. Yeah. So I, Look that up on YouTube because it was really funny. <laughs> I, I, I heard he uh, became pretty popular on TikTok for a while over that as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Went viral on TikTok. 
Yeah, that's uh, perhaps not what we should be spending our time on. You know, what, what's next? Uh, feminine hygiene products for the boys' bathroom too? Well, what I understand is that originally that, that had that in that bill, but um, I believe it was Barbara Ehart pointed that out. And so they made an amendment to change that in committee. Well, when... Um, Oh, I was a I was a poll worker at our election last November, and our location was Central District Health, their headquarters. That's, by the way, oh, people gosh. who told Ada County that uh, we needed to wear masks. So oh, that, that's another issue. Uh, in the men's room there, they had feminine hygiene products. No. I'm surprised somebody didn't throw them in, in like, back east, those boys that they had one of those machines in their dispensers in their bathroom it didn't last 20 minutes they threw it in the toilet and you know people say oh they shouldn't do stuff like that but hey kids know it's good to see that kids know that that is ridiculous well i guess they were bra braver than i was i just uh, left it alone yeah. went back to work but i don't know it, it, it seems like our country is just going crazy we're, we're we're going quickly off the deep end where you know now we aren't even sure what men and women are uh we're not we're not even sure if we should have a border on our you know on our south end and a lot of republicans unfortunately they, they just kind of accept it as okay well this is the new normal and we'll just uh you know instead of trying to fight back against the crazy world, they just say, well, let's make the crazy world a little bit better. Let's uh, make sure it, uh, it runs a little more smoothly. It's, uh, it, it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome. That's the extremism right there. They think I'm extreme, but that is extremism. When you accept open borders, when you accept that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy, that boys, biological boys are in girls sports and hurting them they're injuring them because of course they're bigger um competing even in running or anything like swimming all that stuff that's extremism that is that is not but now it's considered mainstream so yeah all those kind of crazy things and uh i have 12 grandchildren that live in idaho i have a vested interest in preserving our traditional Idaho values for my grandchildren, for my neighbors and friends' grandchildren as well. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's why a lot of us are involved because we're, we look forward not just to the next few months or the next few years, but the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, what uh, kind of society are our great grandchildren going to live in? And it all depends on Absolutely. what we do now. Yeah. Yep. What, um, we're prob probably, you know, running out of uh, things to talk about, although I'm sure oh, we could I'm talk not. about something tonight. But uh, um, I, I just want to make sure we hit the, you know, hit the big ideas. And well, so what, you know, assuming you win, what would you propose or what would you sponsor in the legislature that you don't think they're handling now? What's, what's an issue that, um, you know, they're overlooking that you can bring to the table? Well... There's a few things, um, well, several, but um, I think that we need to quit making new laws. Like every year there's four, five, 600 bills that are put forth. And it isn't all brand new bills, but it is uh, adding to this and adding to that most of the time. There's very little of repealing. And I'm just, I'm getting sick of being controlled. Um, I have sons that are truckers, and they said that regulations are getting tougher on them as well. And I know that we need to preserve our roads, but there just comes a point where they, there's certain people that are really nitpicky, and so they have to hassle with that. And we need our people to be out there working and not being regulated to death. Um, again, I, I think some of the big things are... Uh, taxes. Whenever I talk to people in our district, they say, can't you do something about property taxes? Um, and actually, uh, Rod just introduced this crazy bill to reduce the the majority for bond elections from oh, 6.6, yeah. which is super majority, to 55% in presidential election years. It doesn't matter what year it is. Um, we need to preserve that 66 I drive around and I see new schools, so it's not impossible to pass bonds. But you need the whole, you need two thirds of the community that says, yes, it is time to build a new school. 
Uh, we had a bond election here in Fremont County last year. They wanted a couple new uh, auxiliary gyms. They wanted a performing arts center. They wanted some um, new uh, uh, classrooms yeah. for CTE. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I support CTE. I think it's a great thing. But we're thinking, you know, we've got groceries that are going up. We've got fuel that's going up. Property taxes, supposedly we were getting relief, but some people say, well, I got 40 bucks relief. That is not relief with the inflation, with the things that are going on. And, and so uh, 55% would just kill us. There, There's no reason to be doing that. Um, and it would be a constitutional amendment, so it would have to go through a big process. But why is he proposing something like that? You know, that's just, to me, that's crazy. Grocery tax relief. Just six six bucks for $100 of groceries. That would add up. And I've had people say, well, but we we have a lot of kids, so we get more on the grocery tax credit that we get back. Well, House Bill 448 that Ron Nate kept trying to get through a couple years ago, that actually kept the uh, grocery tax credit, plus it, really, it repealed the 6% um, grocery tax. And so that would have provided so much relief for our families um, because they would still get the tax credit plus the $6 per hundred of groceries. And that does. It really does. It, if, if you kept the tax credit, though, and got rid of the actual tax, wouldn't that be basically just a, a redistribution of wealth from you know one person to another? How would that work? Um, well, it would it would just be a um, our families spend a lot of money on groceries, on other things, and it would just be a, a relief for them. Um, I think we need to help our families. Um, that's the the backbone of our state, of our communities. And so things that we can do to help our families um, to be able to thrive, I just, you know, I, I haven't really thought about it as a redistribution. Um, it's just, I just look at it as being able to um, help families do better in um managing their budgets. Um, I'd rather have them spending the money, our families, than the government, mm -hmm. the bureaucracies, because we've got bloated bureaucracies. There are, there are cuts that we could make and we're not doing that. Um, and at least uh, that's another thing that we kind of talked a little bit about, the maintenance budgets. That has been, um, that will be helpful uh, if they, they just voted on the maintenance budgets to keep those. And then the line items, um, they can look at those. And for example, I guess there was a, one agency <clears throat> that was requesting a $6,000 printer. I saw that. Yeah. So they had to go in and justify that. Well, what if, what if um, uh, a legislator is voting on a bill and saying, look, they should not have, they don't need a $6,000 printer. So um, I really don't want to vote for this. So, you know, that's the hard part is when there's bad stuff in a bill, good stuff in a bill, how do you decide to vote? Um, I was accused of def wanting to defund the police because I voted against a budget that had, well, I don't know if we want to go into that many details, but it, it was like eight more, uh, ISP officers in the Capitol and five more out on the Chinden campus. So that's, we're paying for 13 more officers to be in the government area when they need, I mean, I have officers tell me we need them out on the streets. We need them out on the highway, um, you know, picking up people that are, that have drugs and stuff, you know, things like that. But so I voted no on that bill. And then I was accused of defunding the police. Yeah, that's def definitely a game they play. You know, yeah. you, you you don't you don't like giving the police a new helicopter. Well, then you just you know why why do you hate cops? Why 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 do you hate public safety? Right. It's um you know we we, we see that going on now with you know some of the folks who voted against some of the big budgets last year. But this hopefully this uh, new budget process gives them 
you know, I don't know if it's actually going to reduce spending at all because you still have a majority on JFAC who likes spending our money, uh, but it'll bring some more transparency to the issue. So people, you know, who are willing to take the time can actually see what they're voting on and not just read the headline. And they know why you're voting no. You can you can just pinpoint it right there and say this. We did not need this line item, so this is why I voted no. Yeah, um, I I am not big. Obviously, my opponent has made this big point that I haven't passed bills, that I haven't presented a bunch of bills. I'm not there to pass bills. Um, if if my um, constituents, the citizens, if somebody comes to me, which somebody's already asked me about a certain bill, and I said, hey, when I get elected, then contact me and we'll we'll figure that out. We'll see if we can get a bill uh, put together. But I'm not there to sponsor bills, to to have a, a rush of to add to the four to six hundred bills that we have per year. I am there to do the work of the people, to we we do the budget and I, I would like to see some things repealed. I can't say anything specific other than the grocery tax right now. But um, there, what about uh, what, what about the launch grant? Would you repeal that? Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> you know that's dynamite because people really like that. Like they're just eating that up for their kids. That's another one that is is that the proper role of government for me to pay for my neighbor's child? To go to college. Um, you know, people threw this big fit about uh, Biden when he was doing the loan forgiveness. And it is a little bit different because they committed to paying that money back. But, but the launch, it's giving this money to kids for specific careers that a council decides what's the big, what's the careers that are the hot ones right now. Um, it also does not guarantee that kids stay in Idaho for a set number of years to offset that because that's one of the big things they're saying is is that, you know, that'll help kids stay in Idaho. There's no way that it helps kids. It, it They can get trained here. They'll get offered a uh, job somewhere else. And there goes that $8,000 um, uh, that we put into that. It's gone. And I just, it's just not right because it continue to grow, just like Medicaid expansion. Oh my gosh, you know, they said that's just mm -hmm. gonna be, you know, this, this small amount of people, but we tried to tell people, I wasn't in office then, but that went through the initiative that year. And actually Jefferson and Fremont, when it was on the ballot, they voted no on that. Um, the majority, it was like 52 or 53 percent said, no, we don't want Medicaid expansion. But our legislators um, in our district still voted for it anyway, because they are big spenders. So it really, you know, that, that that's one of, you know, if we look at things from a very high level for a moment, that's one of the fatal flaws of a representative republic is that once people realize they can elect representatives who will give them public money it's kind of over isn't it and we've been it's been like that since the new deal since the 1930s when president roosevelt just figured out he could create interest groups if he gives money to teachers if he gives money to artists if he gives money to writers then those people will be you know will vote for him it's a patronage system we just saw that in the state of the union address tonight biden was president biden was talking about all the different uh, groups that he was going to give money to he was going to give money more money to teachers he was going to help the illegal aliens uh, and all that so you know you, you just said that the launch grant is popular with a lot of people because it's free money essentially it's you know taking money from peter giving it to paul paul yeah. to support that so how how do we as a society and us as citizens and uh, you as legislators, how do we fight that? How do we say, no, I'm not going to give you free money. In fact, I'm going to take away this free money and uh, be, because it's the right thing to do. How, how do we make that argument? Because your opponent can just come in here and say, no, you know, I'll, I'll give you free money. Vote for me and you'll get stuff. Yeah. Well, and that's the rub. It is, it is difficult because people maybe don't want to fund something else but they want to fund something that affects them for the good. And that's what's difficult. See, we've gotten so far away from the 
proper role of government. Um, it drives me crazy when I listen to the news and they're always talking about our democracy. We are being gaslighted into believing that we have a democracy. People don't understand a lot of times anymore what a republic is, what our constitutional republic is, that we have natural laws, that we have uh, representatives that go and vote for us. Um, you know, we, we often joke that a democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding what's for supper. And that's basically what it is. You have a majority, you have 50% plus one. Do we want that kind of democracy? And so that's what I kind of try to do in my small way. And I appreciate all that you do, Brian, in attempting to teach people with your Gem State Chronicle about uh what's going on in the capital so you can see what's going on um you you explain different things having to do with um government and and with right and wrong and so that's we've got to get back to republican principles with a small r hmm. not, not republic as as a republican as a party but republican ish uh value what that really means because in some ways our republican party is polluted and dorothy moon and the state committee are trying to pull us back to our roots to our basic republican values and she's being she and the committee are being fought tooth and nail and they they blame everything um rod has been nasty with dorothy just um he, he, he really seems to very much dislike dorothy moon yeah, he, and he really, and he talks about it a lot yeah he really eviscerates her and the thing is it's it's not dorothy she's the leader but she can't unilaterally do things she has a committee the committee was voted on by uh delegates from all over the state and we're going to be doing that again in Coeur d'Alene. That's why I'm just going to put a little plug in for people to run as precinct officers. We need some good precinct officers that believe the proper role of government is for government basically to stay out of the way and um, to return to those type of principles instead of what they're going to try to spend one or two million dollars to uh, flip our state as far as precinct committeemen yep, the, so uh... that we can the delegates that will kick her out of there. The previous state chairs have uh, committed to raise $2 million to elect PCs that will essentially do their bidding and, you know, be tools of the establishment. Um, you know, one, one thing that people say is that you can't, you can't change things too quickly that, you know, you just, there's just certain things you can't do. You just can't go into the legislature and get rid of Medicaid expansion or Medicaid even. Uh, you can't go in there and you know cut funding, cut the budget, cut these agencies. You can't eliminate agencies. You talk about all these things you can't do. And you watch the legislature and sometimes it feels like that's true because you watch good you know, conservative representatives and senators get nowhere with, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's a struggle just to cut the growth to a, to a manageable level. Right. However, then you look over, say, in Florida, Governor DeSantis and his yeah. legislature over there, they just fired all the right. DEI people in their colleges. You look in other countries, Argentina just elected Javier Millet, yes. and he immediately started cutting government and cutting all the wokeness and, you know, cutting all the federal agencies uh, in, in his country, in Argentina. Uh, so I think it is possible, but you need you need a critical mass of people. I think if there was 105 Kerry Hanks and Tammy Nichols and Brian Lennies and Scott Herndons, I think we would see some, you know, wow. tremendous change. But, you know, we need those people, which means we need good conservative citizens to get out and vote, which is, yeah. that's really where the problem is. People don't realize that how much power they actually have. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had, uh, I've had a couple people that say, yeah, well, our vote doesn't really count. You know, it's only one vote. Well, we had a school board election in Idaho Falls that was decided by one vote. Mm -hmm. So everyone's vote matters. Um, I, I'm just, really hoping <laughs> that I will get a good majority of votes. And yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, it, people need to get involved, you know, but also when you were mentioning uh, representative senators, we need a governor 
like DeSantis. Um, you know, Brad said that he uh, didn't lock down Idaho, but, and maybe technically he didn't he allowed the public uh, health uh, districts, you know, different entities uh, did lock down people. Um, he allowed- he, he issued a stay at home order from his desk that uh, that was enforced by government agencies. So, yeah, yeah. you can do all you want. He basically locked us down. And we were trying to change our emergency orders and we got some things done, but you know, there's people that, that like to be on good terms with the governor that, that won't make the changes that need to be made. Um, you know, the governor, he uh, vetoed one of the tax bills, relief bills, and the legislature went around and uh, overrode that. It was a property tax last year. There you go. And then, I just, I read in a release that he said that he championed that. I'm like, ah! He took credit for it. <laughs> That's politics. Like, that is so disingenuous. You know, if you're going to vote a certain way, then you own that. If you veto something, you own that. Which, that's one more thing about um, Furnace that was so frustrating last year, was he voted three times against protecting children from porn in libraries. Three times. He sustained the governor's veto, he and Raymond, and if either one of them would have voted the other way, um, the, the uh, veto could have been overridden. Yep. And so consequently, we still have the porn in many of the libraries in Idaho. And, and here we are again this year, we still don't have a bill, a decent bill. The, the one was worse than not having anything at all because then the senators and representatives would have said, look, we dealt with the porn in the libraries bill. We've dealt with that issue. So we're done. And so it would have been as bad or worse because it, you know, there's, it was going to be so difficult to get anything um, restricted. And, and why can't we get this stuff restricted? I would like to have it out of the library. I don't think there's really a place for it in the library, in my personal opinion. But I would, I, what we need to pass is House Bill 666 from two years ago that just said the exemption for librarians is gone. And, and museum directors, I think it's too, but just pull that exemption. Why should they be exempted? Because you can give, they could give kids gender queer in the library. You walk out of the library, and if I tried to give them that book, I would be arrested. I would have a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. I would be in big trouble. Why is that, yeah. that we're protecting those librarians in, in the libraries and having that kind of filth? Um, pornography is such a plague. I've talked to people that, you know, these a, a kid, a child sees that as a young child five six seven eight years old and it's with them for the rest of their lives um and it's very difficult to overcome that and and we've got a lot of that um if a, if someone else is has the book and your your child inadvertently looks at it they've got that ish, if that image in their minds and we've you know it's probably impossible to keep kids totally from seeing that, but we, we've got to do the best that we can. We just have a polluted world now. And so whatever we can do to protect our kids, we need to do that. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy that uh, we have actual laws on the books that, you know, if, if you go into the Idaho statutes on what is considered harmful for, to minors, they wrote it down more than 50 years ago when they first created that statute, but they carved out exceptions for schools and libraries. And like you said, museums, uh, but at the time, you know, they didn't have anything like Hustler, you know, any, or Playboy in schools. So, so they assume, I, I assume that they assumed that they, it, it wasn't going to be an issue. But now we have, you know, as much as people, you know, like some of our Republican friends like to say it's not really there, it is there. Um, I, I've seen way too many pictures of these books that are available in, you know, Treasure Valley high school libraries. Uh, and, and it's awful. It, it's about what you would see in a dirty magazine from 50 years ago, oh. or I assume. Uh, and 
and, and we can't find the will to do anything about it. House Bill 666, I just brought it up from 2022. All it does is removes that exception, yep. removes that affirmative yep. defense. It passed the House with 51 votes, including yep. your vote. Yes. Went to the Senate and was you know, stuck in Patty on Lodge's drawer. Yep. Next year, they come back with House Bill 3. Well, no, they first did uh, House Bill 139. Uh, and that one got stuck in House Education because, you know, Representative Yamamoto, Representative McCann, they wouldn't hear it. They, uh, they, they didn't want anything to do with it. I remember the chairman of that committee, uh, Yamamoto, uh, wouldn't even let people read from these books because there were underage pages in the room. But she voted to allow them to remain in high school libraries. It doesn't make any sense. And then 314 comes through and that gets through, but the governor vetoes it. And then this year we have 389, which gets to the floor and then is pulled back for a compromise. And then that compromise bill, which I was even giving the, the compromise bill the benefit of the doubt. And I took a lot of flack for it, um, but it, it was just too much. It was you know watered down too much. And uh, so, so that failed. And now we've, you know, now we've got nothing and we've still got these yeah. books on these shelves and, you know. In so parents need to be very, very vigilant, but it's like, okay, so I drive bus. What if some kid brings gender queer, we'll just use that, brings onto the bus, opens it up and all around them are looking at it. So that's one point that, you know, you can't, I can't control that as a bus driver. I don't know what they're looking at. I'm trying to stay on the road and drive the bus. Uh, another thing is, what is that kid like that sees those images over and over? He's going to school and sitting next to your child in school. What, what kind of um, personality, what kind of things are developing in that poor child's mind as he's growing? And, you know, um, so there's there's all kinds of things to consider um, with allowing that. Senator Cook actually was on the radio in that on Neil's show that I referenced earlier, and he said he didn't really believe that there was all this stuff going on. And so he walked down to a Boise library and he said he walked in and there it was. And actually, um, Senator Burtonshaw voted against it, too. So I'm sure that Cook had a had some influence on him and saying, look, this is real. This really happens. Um, it's right there in our libraries. So we need to get rid of this. But there's just a not enough will to do it. If there was enough will, it would be done. Well, that's why I said we need a 105 Carrie Hanks in the legislature. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, th th things would definitely get done, I think. But, there's uh, some really great, there's some really great representatives and senators in our legislature, and I just want so much to be over there and to help with that to get the numbers high enough that we can preserve our values. Because, you know, people ask me why God vote for this, and why would he vote against that? I have no idea. I, it'd be great if he'd come on your show and you could ask him that. Yes, I, and he, he is invited. But what happens is, you know, people email him, they, they say stuff to him on Facebook, and he blocks them. I've had so many people tell me that he blocks them, so he doesn't answer them. And if you look at our um, campaign money, uh, I have, I bet, 90 95% from individuals. And... When I looked at his the other day, his was his was way up on um, companies that have donated to his uh, account, and he's got a few people, um, people that are kind of associated with some of the PACs that um, put money against us. But that's the way it is, and so I I'm really working on grassroots ways of contacting people of um, letting them know, know what my values are and explaining to them that I am called an extremist, but it's because I believe in those basic principles that used to be called mainstream. Yeah, basically, you know, some, somebody who has the same views as a Democrat 30 years ago is an extremist, a right-wing extremist today, whereas, you know, somebody, you know, like your opponent or like, you know, several other Republicans in the legislature, I think would have been far to the left of Democrats 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I just don't understand it. The only thing when people ask me, I say uh, power and money. Those are the two things that push 
politicians. I don't even like to be called a politician because I, it's a dirty word. I'm just, it, to me it is. It, it's like, I, I, and I tell them, I never want to be a politician. I go there for the people. I represent the people. And, you know, when, when I'm voting, when I'm thinking about um, how I'm going to vote on something, I picture my neighbors. I picture my family, my friends, and how this will affect them, how this will affect their budgets. That's what's important. You know, the state budgets, I think it'd be great if we just did the maintenance thing and they have to work it out like we all have to work it out. We can't just go get more money somewhere. Imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, we have to deal with the budget that we have. And so that's what I believe with um, our state agencies and departments. I realize we're getting more people and stuff, but but we can shift. We can make things work. And, and the things that we can keep local, we need to do that because there's less fraud. There's less waste when things are more at a local level. So the things that we can deal with at a lo local level, that's where that needs to be. Well, it is getting late. I am feeling a little bit tired. Oh my gosh! Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, tell us uh, what do you have coming up? Do you have some events, uh, um, and where can people find you online? Okay, well, kerryhanks.com, K-A-R-E-Y H-A-N-K-S.com. I'm on Facebook, um, Instagram a little bit, not as much. I'm on X. So um, I, I try to keep up with that. I am a little bit an older person, but I try to keep up with all those different um, social media places. Um, we do have, I have an event in Dubois, which is in Clark County, um, coming up March 23rd. Um, we have some, uh, our uh, local uh, central committees have some things scheduled more in April and May. But um, we're just, we're kind of lining things up now. Uh, we have some cottage meetings, things like that. So yeah, we're working on things. And we actually, um, my friend is doing a Scott Cleveland event uh, Monday, uh, next Monday, not this coming Monday, but the Monday after that. I'm not sure what day that is, but um, in Rigby. So um, I'm planning on being there. I think there will be people that that you know might think the same as I do, and um, and and might be interested in finding out more about Scott Cleveland. There's just things like that. There's just little events here and there. Um, not really well, anything big yet. But thank you for asking. Well, no, that's that that's exciting. And like I said, I, I I'd love to come out to Eastern Idaho one of these days and uh, and see your neck of the woods. It sounds uh, like a very interesting place. Well, let me know. We uh, Daniel Murphy came out here uh, <clears throat> last year for harvest, and, and I got to take him in my truck, and he got to see how we dig spuds and and how they're loaded into the um, combines, and it's just it it was kind of fun for him to do that. So, and I I do I love working on the farm, driving truck. Um, I just I'm a farm girl, and I love it, but. But I'm willing to sacrifice <laughs> and go to Boise and serve the people there as well because it's very important. So, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time and you know, good luck. And um, yeah, well, uh, I'm sure we'll see you around again in the future. Oh yeah, I'm going to be actually in Boise next week. I'm the I'm the Fremont County Republican Women President. And it's Red Jacket Days, Monday and Tuesday. Ah. So I will be over there. So I'm sure I'll see you because I'd like to go to a couple committees and and uh, meet with some of my legislator friends and see what I can do to help. Cool. Well, uh, we will see you then. All right. Well, thanks, Brian, so much. Have a good night. Thanks. There. Oh, it's magic. So yeah, I, I am getting tired, so I'll uh, wrap this up here soon. But thank you to Carrie Hanks for spending uh, an hour of her time with us, sharing her vision, her passion, her desire to uh, serve the people. That's that's always a refreshing attitude. I mean, all politicians say that, uh, but sometimes you can tell when they mean it and when they don't. Um, uh, speaking, though, of uh, other politicians, Representative Furness is, of course, welcome to come on. Um, so far, I don't think any of the so-called establishment people have taken up the offer to come on this show.
but they are always welcome. Uh, you know, we can have a conversation. This is uh, this is America. This is Idaho. We can talk. You know, we can disagree. Um, but you know, maybe we'll find some common ground. Maybe we'll uh, hash out some of our disagreements. But at the same time, you know, it's it's just talking. It's uh, there. There, people shouldn't be afraid of that. Yeah, so so many politicians, I think, are afraid of speaking their mind, of going on something that's unscripted, and so they they'd rather have the little, you know, five minute sound bites on the news, or you know, something carefully controlled where it can be edited. Uh, but if you're really acting on principle, and if you have deep seated principles, and you're presenting your true self. I don't think there's anything to fear from going on something unscripted and just sharing what you uh, what you believe in, um, and I think that's endearing to people. You know, as Americans, we love authenticity, and so much of politics now is not authentic at all. So, a uh, uh, few things I wanted to mention. I meant to bring this up earlier uh, in the conversation, but um, there was a vote today in the Senate that was really interesting. So there was this bill. It was about is joining Idaho to this interstate compact for counseling licensing. Honestly, I don't understand the entire thing. It's, um, you know, the arguments for it were that it would streamline the ability for counselors to, you know, whether if they're out of state to help people in Idaho or vice versa, or if somebody's traveling, it, it just kind of breaks down the barriers there. Whereas the arguments against it were that it might diminish Idaho sovereignty, because once you join this compact, then there were fears that um, uh, fears that uh, it would mean we'd have to accept other states' rules regarding the counseling field, such as, you know, having to support gender transitions or social justice initiatives or whatever. Anyway, it passed the House, went through the Senate side, and it was being debated in the Senate today. And my own senator, uh, Scott Grow, stood up and read a letter that he had been given from a therapist who is in his district, in my district. And that letter convinced him to vote against the bill. It failed 17 to 18, one vote. So one person uh, writing a letter to one state senator managed to change the tides of this bill. So if there's something that you are passionate about if there's a bill that comes up that you you know it's an area that you're really interested in or you have a lot of experience with something that is near and dear to your heart if you talk to your legislators send them an email call them on the phone go down to the capitol and grab them as they're going from one committee to another they then you might make a difference call your friends tell them to do the same thing you can make a difference in this. You know, we, there's not much you and I can do at the national level. You know, we watched, I don't know if you did, but I watched that circus of a State of the Union address where an angry old man who was probably hopped up on all sorts of stimulants was, you know, yelling at stuff. You know, actually, actually it was kind of entertaining. He, he, he was actually going back and forth with the Republicans in the, uh, in the House chamber and yelling at them and they were yelling back. It, it it was kind of entertaining. It reminded me almost of, um, you know, question time in the British Parliament where they they actually yell at each other. We it's, we, we should bring that here, make po politics a little more of a context for it. But anyway, my point is, there's not much we can do individually at the national level. Things are going to happen that are going to happen, and you know whether we want like it or not. But at the state level, at the local level, you have the ability to make a difference, whether you are calling your legislator and sharing something that's important to you about something they're considering or running for PC. You know, the filing window is open right now. Uh, you can just download a, f a form from your county clerk, turn it in, and you can be on the ballot to be a precinct committee man. That is the lowest level of political organization. That is the foundation of the political parties. Or, you <coughs> excuse me, you can be a legislator. You can do what Kerry Hanks did and, you know, decide to run. Maybe you won't win at first. Maybe you'll, you know, in her first uh, race, I was looking it up, she got crushed 50 to 25. But then she came back again and beat the same person that beat her. And now she's coming back again uh, to, you know, to try and get in there yet again. And that's all these people are. You know, the 105 people who make up the legislature are just regular people. You know, some of them are business owners. Some of them are rich. Some of them are not rich. You know, there's teachers, there's homemakers, there's farmers. Uh, there's lawyers, a lot of lawyers, uh, there's accountants in there. 
they're, they're, they're just regular people who have decided to, you know, step up. And a lot of the people who have stepped up have, I think, the wrong view of the purpose of government. So maybe it's time for you to step up. You know, there are so many ways to get involved. So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I'm going to just start rambling here because I'm ready to go to bed. So uh, make sure you come back next week. Uh, Freedom Bros will be on not on Thursday next week, but on Friday. Friday the 15th is an interesting day. Like I mentioned just now, the filing period for you know filing to run for state legislature, for U.S. Congress, um, even for precinct committee men, it goes from last Monday, the 4th of March, all the way to Friday after next. So uh, not tomorrow, but Friday the 15th of March. So that's your filing period. That's when everybody is filling out the paperwork to get on the ballot. And so you can actually go to the website. It's uh, voteidaho.gov. And you can click the links through to see who has already filed. And it's kind of a fun little game to see who's filed. And, you know, you know that some people are going to wait until next week. They're going to wait until the last minute because they want it to be a surprise. And then there's going to be other games they play where they file to run, but then they withdraw and put someone else in there. And it's, it's a little bit of brinksmanship. It's, it, it's part of the game. But next Friday, March 15th, here on Freedom Bros, we are going to have a super show. We are going to have, hopefully, Dustin and Greg will be with us, um, and I'll be there. And we're going to invite a whole bunch of people from the world of Idaho politics. Who, and we're going to look at who is running, who has filed for the legislature, who's filed for the House, who's filed for the Senate. We'll break down who those people are, what those races are. We're going to you know, point out some of the races where we've got some really interesting matchups. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure to set your calendars for Friday, March 15th probably right here at nine o'clock as usual. And uh, yeah, we, we're, we're going to have a lot of fun talking about the upcoming election because once once that filing period closes on Friday the 15th, I believe it's at 5 p.m., it's on. It's, you know, six, well, how, how many weeks? I don't know. Just, just a little over two months because it's May 21st is the uh, election. It's too late for math. Uh, from, from that point, 5 p.m. on the 15th, all the way through to May 21st, so just over two months, that is your primary election, and it's going to be a knockdown, drag out, you know, fight in the mud because we have an old guard establishment who has, for the first time in a long time, been injured. They've realized that their power is not infinite, that they are not omnipotent. You know, the Senate went from just having one or two conservatives to having about 11 or 12 now, 13 even. The House, you know, we still need a few more there. The Republican Party went from being run by, you know, an old guard establishment person to a fiery fighter for the grassroots in Dorothy Moon. And that old guard has been extremely frustrated and waiting to get back in the game. And so they are going to throw everything they can at this election. They want to take back the precinct committee men spots. You know, uh, Tom Luna and Trent Clark and you know, their friends have committed to raise $2 million so that they can take over the Republican Party. They are going to throw everything they have at the legislature. IACI and all their friends, all the big businesses and special interests and lobbyists and PACs, they're throwing millions of dollars into this legislative race to try and make sure that they control the legislature because that controls the purse springs. That is how they get things like the launch grant, which funnels, you know, millions of dollars, $8,000 per student from the taxpayer to these businesses. It's, it's an investment to them when they donate money to candidates or when they spend time lobbying. It's, they're, they're getting a return on their investment by getting laws like that passed. And populists, conservatives, people who really serve the people stand in the way of that. And so they're going to try and destroy them. They're going to try and replace senators like Brian Lenny and Scott Herndon and Glenita Zeiderveld and um, uh, Tammy Nichols with stooges, basically, who will just vote for whatever they're told. And they're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of time and energy doing that. So it's going to be a crazy election. And next Friday, March 15th, 9 o'clock here on Freedom Bros, we will break it down and tell you what you can expect and how you can get in the game. So 
with that, I'll stop my rambling and I will see you next Friday.